What's up? What are you? Hello. Hi. <laughs> Today Hi. we're talking about these two. Remember these two? Can you believe it? From the SAG Awards. This was pictures from the SAG Awards. I couldn't show these on the radio. But everybody was like, oh. Oh, look at her laughing at his jokes. The cutest one was where he was right there. Oh. Oh. Except for the whole thing where they were married from 2000 to 2005 Hello. and got divorced in a horrible, messy thing. And what he did. Hello. I didn't even pay attention. I was praying or something. I missed, <laughs> yeah, right. I was reading Whatever. my Bible. I missed that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. What we're talking about today is Jim Daly from Focus on the Family wrote a great commentary, uh, thought-provoking, about Jennifer Aniston and Brad Pitt's SAG Award interaction, demonstrating the healing power of forgiveness. Now, we came in the office today, and I was all excited about... Jesus, sacrificial love, and Janelle was like, whoa, don't go too far, Brian. And I was like, wait a minute, the gospel, Janelle, she's like, oh wait a minute. Goodness. So that's a, a little melodramatic, but, but basically these two were shown having a great time talking to each other and smiling and laughing, and they were married for a season and had a terrible breakup. Five years together. Crazy. And the internet's like, maybe they're getting back together and isn't this great. And Jim Daly was saying, essentially, it's a beautiful example of the radical nature of forgiveness. Yeah, that's great. And also, uh, you can over overcome the deep pain of a divorce. Not that you would necessarily get married again, but you can be able to interact like that. Yeah. And Janelle doesn't like that. Right, Janelle? Go ahead, tell me. I didn't say I didn't like it. <laughs> what I said was, we don't know what they've talked about. So I'm just saying, in general, I am I'm quick to say yes, forgiveness all the way. But res restoration of fellowship, I think we should approach it with more cautiousness and wisdom and discernment. And I think the Bible makes it conditional. But isn't restoration, like you talked a lot on the air about repentance being key, and you're right. What happens after repentance? That, repentance like, spi is like spiritually you repent and you're forgiven. reconciled to God in Christ right For repentance that's the condition so isn't the ideal reconciliation not necessarily yes. a marriage but being able to do this yes. with someone you that's wrong you. I can even do that without repentance I was talking about re-engaging and, and re uh, establishing fellowship with someone we shouldn't be as quick to do. And I don't think fellowship, um, forgiveness always equals uh, fellowship. Jim says, I'm not trying to be contentious, but oh, would, I you, like it already. would you not mind showing us the act of repentance in Matthew 18, 23 through 35? Okay, Tino. I don't know where this is going. Jim and I have not talked about this oh, in advance. Matthew what? Matthew 18? 18. Race you to it. Oh my gosh. What's the verse? 20 what? 23. So Therefore part. the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. Oh yeah, I, I read that during In the, the process, one of his debtors was brought in and owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything owed to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave him his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I will pay it, he pleaded, but his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When, when some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset. They went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. When the king called in the man and he had forgiven and said, You evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison and tortured him until he paid his debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Right. So since the Bible doesn't contradict itself, <laughs> can you, Jim or Brian, explain then to me where Jesus says, be on your guard in Luke 17, if your brother sins, rebuke him, and if he repents, forgive him. 
repentance and forgiveness come together. Even in First John, when when we talk about God forgiving us, we have to repent. Now, I'm, you can forgive. That doesn't mean they got to be all up in your life again. You know, and I think people, you're, you are vulnerable to a lot. You, you're vulnerable. But where's the line and the boundary? I mean, yeah, I get it. You find out your ex is a serial killer. You shouldn't hang out with them. Yeah. But in most circumstances, we, of course, we may not be able to get to like, we're buddies who talk all the time, but even if they haven't repented, shouldn't there be some measure of you displaying that radical forgiveness? And like, you could have an interaction like this. Yeah. If someone who's not repented has hurt you. Right. Shouldn't you have an interaction like that? Yes, I said yes to that. It's the fellowship that I'm talking about. So where's the boundary? Help me. The boundary. Oh, Hannah Nitz is here. Hannah Nitz. Yeah. Hannah Nitz. Hi, Hannah. Um, Adrian says, are we sure it was genuine interaction and acting or acting for the show? We don't know. I mean, they could have been making it all up because the cameras were watching them. Hi, Callie and Julie. I think people Julie. were captured by it because it looked genuine. Yeah, it did look different. And shared. he had been to last year to her 50th birthday party, by the way, at her house. Which helps enhance this, but the quote I loved is, the genuine affection between the former power couple had the internet in full swoon. So people saw it as genuine. Yeah. So help me find the boundary. Jennifer Jones is asking, by the way, what's the topic here? We're talking about Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston and their interaction at the SAG Awards. And how Jim Daly, I focus on the family, use it as an example to demonstrate the power, the healing power of forgiveness, and how these two have every reason to hate each other, but had a great interaction. And Janelle gave, essentially was giving caution on this, in fairness. I think so. Saying that with forgiveness, you must exercise some measure of caution. No, you forgive. Well, oh, yeah, I'm sorry. In terms of restoration. Restoring fellowship doesn't necessarily always come with forgiveness. So where is the line? I think with true relationship, there's a level of vulnerability. And that's what I mean. When you're back in fellowship with someone in terms of friendship and all that, you put your guards down. And now you're trusting, right? So that's what I'm saying. I wouldn't put my guards down with people that have not repented you know you could still forgive I shared a story it, I didn't share the full story but I have a family member that I had to forgive without this person ever have asked me they've never asked me for forgiveness uh, but we're not in fellowship and I think it would be unwise for me to re-engage with this person because of the now, nature of the way they hurt you right but I've had other people hurt me, and when people come to you and say, man, I did this and this was wrong, and I'm sorry, that makes it where I can entertain, like, okay, we can, we can consider putting my guards down and re like re-engaging. So but to have a person not even see what they did, admit it, repent, how do you know you're not going to be hurt again? You don't. Or that you're not exposing others to whatever it is that they did. But, I mean, right, right before more. that, that the parable we, we read from Matthew 18 was instigated by Peter asking, like, how many times should I forgive those who hurt me? And Jesus' answer was basically a bajillion times, 70 times 7, which right. is not a bajillion, but you know what I mean. And so forgiveness is unconditional. We, we must extend it because we've been forgiven. And our sins are so great that there's nothing someone can do to us yeah. that, would even, that, that would even begin to compare to what we've done to God on a daily basis and thought, Lord, indeed. Right. So what is that boundary between, because I agree with you, there's certain situations where we don't want to be foolish and allow re restoration to make us unsafe. But I think Christian, Christian forgiveness is so radical. Yeah. Like, what is, what is forgiveness and restoration without fellowship even look like? Like, help me understand what that looks like. What does forgiveness without fellowship look like? Yeah. So, like, with this person that I haven't forgiven, we're not, this person isn't, like, hanging at my house or, like, oh, let's have dinner together or we're not talking on the phone all the time. 
but I've talked this over to my mom and I'm like, how do I know if I've forgiven this person? She was like, you know in your heart that whenever this person needs you, you're there. So an example, my mom is involved in this situation. This person lost a daughter, lost a daughter, like dead, instant, it was crazy. And my mother, after years of not talking to this person, went to his funeral and went and sat there and mourned with them, never re-engaged again. But she's like, that's how you know, like, it's, it's a journey, but it's like, I'm there for you if you need me, but do we need to be hanging? Do I need to be telling you my secrets or having you around my kids? Do you see what I'm saying? I think no, I, to, I totally get to that. trust and to put your guards down, depending on the situation, because, I mean, we're talking about different, you know, marriage is one thing. I just think, I, not you, but I think there are believers who feel like someone else's lack of forgiveness uh, gives them permission to not be as nice, gives them permission to be kind of cold, gives them permission to be rude. No. Or maybe talk you don't about have to, it. No. But do you see why like, people feel they're justified in that? Because it's the revenge they yeah. want for the injustice then you gotta of the person. you got to search your heart. Revenge. Did you really forgive? If you truly forgave, then you can be friendly. I know there are some people, and I am like super trusting and super friendly, that I will not, like, I just feel it in my gut and I keep them at a distance. That you could still be cool with someone, you don't think? I mean, don't, we know as adults how to have different grades of interaction with people. Jim says, I don't disagree about forgiveness must lead to fellowship, but I'm not certain forgiveness needs to be predicted predicated but, on repentance. I've forgiven the person who murdered my sister, but he has never repented. Yes, and, and you, you agree I with did that. the same thing. You agree yeah. with that. Fellowship is the one that I uh, I don't know about that one. To cut to re-engage, we have to be wise as serpents. And when people have certain tendencies, you're not only exposing yourself, you're exposing people around you. And I don't I don't think it's wise. And see, I, I think our, our point of disagreement is so fine. Mm-hmm. It sometimes feels like a giant chasm, but it's not. Because I think it's really unwise and unsafe in certain circumstances to create, like, restored as previous restoration with someone who's not a safe person, emotionally, physically, sexually, whatever. Okay? However, what I'm trying to articulate is that the radical nature of Christ's sacrifice for me and his forgiveness for me is so radical that it's almost like even if you have that boundary up of restoration... People should like not even know. Like if you end up running into your ex who's not safe, yeah, and and you walk away and somebody goes, "Who was that?" and you go, "Oh, that was my ex," and they go, they, "They should go, what? That's who that was?" Right. Like it should be so shocking that you were that unconditionally loving and forgiving towards that person. There's no question about the fact. Like they, they should be like, "Oh, are you guys friends now?" and you go, "No, I'm I'm keeping myself safe." because of X, Y, and Z, but I forgive them. I care about them. Like, I don't want that wall to be between the two of, well, you're not safe and you didn't repent, so, you know, I have permission to not have to engage with you in a Christ-like way. Yeah, but that's not how I'm defining fellowship. I'm defining, like, saying hi and, go, like, it depends. Like, let's say you had a friend that started spreading rumors around you, about you or sharing things that you have shared with them. And this person, I, I forgave them. That doesn't mean, oh, you know what happened with my between me and Len? Even though we've been friends for decades, it would be like our relationship isn't going back there. Do you see what I'm saying? That would be dumb. Even though that's not physical danger or no, now it's like, okay, our relationship has changed because you've proven untrustworthy. But we're cool. I'll see you. Hey, what's up? But uh, we're not like best friends anymore. And that person may wonder, like, yo, you don't tell me, like, we don't have intimate conversations anymore. No, we don't. <laughs> like, I don't see why that's not, that's why that's so connected to, why we can't understand that's not connected to forgiveness. There, you got to change the way you engage people. When oh, people, yeah. I love the saying, Maya Angelou, when people tell you who they are, believe them the first time. There's wisdom behind that. You know, we're mothers, daughters, like we got to protect reputation. There's physical danger. And see, uh, I, I agree with you. I don't think we disagree in principle on the whole thing. I'm just exercising the caution of 
there's danger in setting up barriers connected to repentance and forgiveness yeah. for Christians in that we could be sending a message that's just not biblical. I don't think you're doing that. Yeah. I'm just saying because I think you would handle it very maturely and well, and you have in these situations. But in the hardness of our hearts and our need for revenge in the flesh, like it should be such a radical forgiveness that still has that boundary yeah. of, of no fellowship when it's not safe. That it's a shock to the world there's no fellowship. Yeah, I agree. But that's stuff you don't walk around talking about necessarily. That's stuff you know in your heart. Like, I'm yeah. watching this person. Look, you know, I got to... It's like my mom said. She always tells me, don't subtract people from your life. Don't subtract, don't subtract. And then she... I struggle with that because I'm either, like, knee-deep deep into a relationship. Like, I either, like, have friends forever... I don't have associates. And so mommy said, you have to learn how to have different categories. So if somebody hurts you, don't subtract them. You recategorize them. They may never know. But now I know where I'm going to put you. You know, and I think that's wise. Linda says, does the true definition of forgiveness include reconciliation? We're called to be willing to forgive if asked, and the other person has repented. Repent. Other than that, maybe we're just talking about not holding a grudge. Being mean, talking about their behind them, behind their back, and revenge, which most people call forgiveness. I look at it like we should do everything we can for reconciliation if it can happen. We know we have the right heart attitude if we wish them well, but that doesn't mean there can be reconciliation. We are to forgive like God. He's willing to forgive anyone if we repent. He loves us, but he doesn't forgive everyone when they don't repent. Some people will not repent and will not go to heaven. Jennifer says, we also need to leave room for restoration. I believe the issue is we close the door and lock it sometimes. Yeah, that's true. Well, we only need to pull it shut a bit. I and that's, that's closer, Jennifer. That's closer to what I'm trying to articulate, but you're saying it better than me. I'm glad you said it that way. Like, I'm not as comfortable with, uh, you, oh, you didn't repent? Shut, lock, throw away the key. Yeah. You, but what she's saying is you, you may, like, almost close the door. But you're not going to lock it or throw away the key. Yeah, I agree. But it, isn't it about the heart condition? Of the person? Because somebody can go, I forgive him, but he's still a jerk. Yes, and if I'm going to be honest, I'll be honest here, and, <laughs> and it may not sound too biblical, but I've had different situations where it's a process to get to that point. You know, it's not instant, like, oh, I forgave you, okay, cool, we're not in fellowship, but... It's a process, and it's it's a journey from you still hurt me, and I forgave you in my mind, but in my heart I haven't. And then you slowly get to where the Lord heals you, and you can say, I fully forgave you, even though I can't re-engage. So I think it is unrealistic, if I'm honest with myself, for me to say, oh no, when people hurt me, psh, it's instant, I forgave you. Oh, yeah, no, that's not realistic. You could say that in your mind and have the best intentions and still have, like, I can't believe, like, all those thoughts, you know? I hard. think it's a, a safe parallel to take the passage that says, Lord, I believe, help me with my unbelief. Where you can say the same thing with forgiveness. Where you can say, Lord, I forgive them, help me with my unforgiveness. Yeah. With my, with my lack of forgiveness in my heart. Um... I, I think part of the struggle we all have in trying to really in, in our hearts forgive people is that we forget the source of the forgiveness. Yeah. The source is not our human will to forgive or an intellectual decision. It's first a recognition of the radical nature of God's forgiveness for us. It's really about us. Yeah. And that acknowledgement enables us to forgive others. Enables, but I think it's still a process. Still a process. And we're assuming, like I'm just out of respect, even though this person's not in my life, I'm not going to share what they did, but because, whatever, it's in the family. Um, We're assuming people hurt you one time, but when you forgave someone and then they keep hurting you, you forgive them 70 it times. It is seven. like, I, whoever's feeling that out there, I feel you. I mean, you could have, we could walk around saying, the Lord said, and because we're saying in Psalm, you see examples of David saying, Lord, I don't feel this. You could get real with the Lord and be like, hey, I am, it could take you years. And then you feel like you did it, and then boom, you get hurt again. It's a process, you it's know? It's definitely a process. So not only non-repentance, but re-injuring over and over. 
which Jesus oh, directly wow. adge- addressed when Peter complained, God, why can't, what do you mean? I got to forgive somebody seven times? And it's Jesus talking about that radical nature of forgiveness yeah. when he says 70 times seven. And, and it's that, I, again, I think the problem is people misdirect the source of their forgiveness. It's not an act of the will. Right. It starts with you acknowledging that you every day keep hurting and offending God right. the same way over and over right. and over again, worse than that person is wronging you. You know, that's what? the I only place we take, can get there. I would even take because forgiveness. Okay, you you get to the point. My issue is really restoration of fellowship. I would take, and I've done this before, for the people that struggle with certain sins. If they've if they've come to you and said, "Man, I'm I'm so sorry, I hurt you," and then they re-injure, you take that differently. Mm-hmm. Like you'll work with that than a person that never repents, never admits, confesses nothing. Those are people that I think you need to disengage from. I agree with Forgive that. Forgive and disengage. I don't even need people. Like I get the whole forgiveness. I don't even need people to ask me for forgiveness. I've been free of that. Thank God. But I think there's we need to be discerning when we approach these things. Sherry said, oh, it, I, she says she agrees. It's a process. You can't just get over it. You get <coughs> through it. Um, Kathy says you forgive, but you keep your boundaries. Linda says you can make a choice to forgive and not get revenge, and that can be a firm choice. But the process begins, especially with really hard things. And you may have to make the choice over and over. It's a choice to get on the path, re, um, viewing it, as how God forgave us. And that's the linchpin. And if I'm going to get real too, when my mother said, when I was like, how do I know if I forgave this person? And then she was like, you know, he suffers from heart disease. She was like, you know, if he ever lands in the hospital, for example, we were just talking of examples. You get a ticket and you show up. You know? Do you understand how much you would be like working with your flesh? You know, I just want to make it real. Because I think sometimes we spiritualize these conversations and think you make it. Like, you're just spiritual and, you know, the Lord forgave me and you'll just... And then when you're sitting there struggling, you feel guilty. But my mom is helping me realize, no, like, sometimes it's a process that you have to, like... Because it takes you to different levels. The person called me or the person needs me. And see, I agree with that, but... As you grow in, in intimacy and closeness with Jesus, doesn't it get easier as time goes by? Lydia, amen. She says sometimes we don't have energy for all the drama. But doesn't it, the closer you get to Jesus, doesn't it get easier to forgive? Yes, I agree with that. So if somebody's really struggling with, with unforgiveness, perhaps the answer is not to grapple with that issue, but to get closer to Christ. Right. And I, know, I don't want to sound hyper-spiritual here, but I've been reading Nancy Kane's book, um, Stages of the Soul. Yeah, it's an amazing book. And she really helps redirect this, that we want forgiveness from them and we want them to repent because we think we deserve it. Yeah. And we want them to suffer. And neither of those things are true or things that we should want. Yeah, I agree. Because we don't deserve grace, God's grace through Christ, but we get it anyway. Yeah. And we got to remind ourselves of that daily. Yeah, we do. We do. And I think for me, the wisdom comes in in terms of do you need to re-engage and I've heard people making them equal, and that I don't think they're equal. And when you think they're equal, and you're thinking, I shouldn't re-engage with this person, then you walk around feeling like, oh, I'm a Christian, I should forgive them. You can forgive and not re-engage with a person. You Niall make sure says, I think it's a fine line between forgiveness and tolerance. I can tolerate someone I haven't forgiven just to be cordial to them. Oh, yes. Yeah. For me, forgiveness is more than just tolerating them enough to be around them when I have to. That is, see, that's more Niles. People are saying it better than I could. That's what I'm trying to talk about. That's the heart condition. Yeah. yeah. I forgive them. I tolerate them. No, then maybe you haven't forgiven them. Yep. Good point, Niles. Yeah, that was good. Kathy says, sometimes we forgive kind of with strings attached. We want them to respond the way we think they should. That's right. And that's not what forgiveness is about. Yeah. Because you keep hurting God every day. Were it not for Christ, you'd be going straight to hell. So forget what the Bible says about repentance. <laughs> what? No, I'm just saying. Like, so we're saying no. Just forgive. Stop. Stop attaching like anything to it, even though the Bible attaches repentance to it. Um. 
in our condition with the Lord, all he expects of us to receive the gift of uh, salvation no. is repentance. Repentance, that's what I'm saying. But it's There's not required of us from others. a whole lot of people others. that are going to get forgiveness, a whole lot of people that have not repented. And we're called to forgive them anyway. Right. We are called to forgive them anyway. Even though Jesus and seven, so what do you do with 17? What? When Jesus, in Luke 17, when Jesus said, if your brother hurts you and repents, forgive him. I still think that we're called to forgive regardless of how many times people hurt us. Yeah. And whether or not they ask for it. Okay. And then uh, what do you do with fellowship? Because that's that was the original point of the conversation. I agree with you that we have to be cautious with restoring fellowship. But the goal should be radical Christ-like forgiveness. Yeah. And, and restoration is the ideal. Right. But that's out of your hands. Yeah. A lot of it depends on the other person. Yeah. No question. Sarah says... Uh, one thing that helps me discern if I have forgiven is to ask if I would wish harm on the person who hurt me. If not, I can discern that I do not hold vengeance in my heart. Yep. I struggled with that, Sarah, because I didn't. I mean, I'm indifferent with the person, but I don't want them in my life because of the lack of repentance and whatever, all that sort of stuff. And that's why I had to ask my mom, like, how do I know? And I liked her response with, like, what would you do right now? I mean, this is your, this is a family member if he got sick. You know, so she was helping me because she was the one that showed up for one of the funerals he had. So I like what you said in terms of figuring out how you really feel. Did you really forgive? Jennifer says, I think some offenses are so, how do you pronounce that? I'm heinous. Sorry. Heinous, sorry. That after forgiveness, you need counseling to overcome the trauma. Amen. Sometimes the memory of the trauma continues to rub salt in an open wound, causing you to continue to replay the initial offense and feel as though you're experiencing it the first time, thus causing you to forgive, having to forgive again. Yeah, Rob, this could go into double overtime. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a sports term, as I understand it. <laughs> yeah, he's all happy. Uh, Misty says, oh my goodness, hello, y'all. Preach, you are speaking directly to a bunch of family issues I'm dealing with now. Yes, Misty, you can rewatch all of them. We all we have all the overtime stuff posted. Yeah, we don't mention that very often, but all of them are archived. You can see every single overtime episode, all 149 of them now, uh, on our Facebook page. Yes, Terry, I agree. In my experience, forgiveness is something in my heart, which is reflected in my mental attitude toward the person. Restoration has to do with the relationship, which may or may not be restored right um i just don't think we often i think we can easily as christians forget that direct connection about the true understanding of the gospel is what enables us to forgive yeah it's true. not i'll say it again it's not an act of the intellectual will we don't have the intellectual capacity to forgive just for forgiveness sake right it's out of understanding the forgiveness that was extended to us when we didn't deserve it. Yeah. And we continue to not deserve it, and we're not going to deserve it tomorrow. That's where the source of our ability to forgive comes from, because we've been forgiven so much more yeah. than is required of us for this other person. That's the source of it. And I think when we find the source, we can get through the process more quickly yeah. and at least can go through the process at all. When I've seen people quote Maya Angelou when she says, when people show you who they are, believe them the first time. It's especially women who are very quick, especially in relationships. Oh, he said he's changed. And I'm not just talking about when he pushes you around or hits you physically. Women. I am so serious. Like, I'm going to keep it real because my husband is awesome. So I don't need to forgive Len. But <laughs> Raina, when she's a teenager, I'm not going to be like, well, baby, he said I'm sorry. Like, you got to be smart, girl. And when people show patterns... You gotta have, uh, what is it? You gotta have conditions to having people in your life. You have to. Now you could be awesome and love people like Christ did, go to the hospital for them, love them. But I think we engage people that we got no business engaging. But this and I is think a hard. Fall short. But that's a hard thing to teach to a kid. Well, I'm talking about a teen. She's like, I'm talking about. It's hard to teach to a teen. When she starts dating, you gotta train. No. You don't think it's hard to teach that concept? Don't you fear that you could tip a little bit towards unforgiveness and no, training you your child forgive. towards unforgiveness? You can forgive and still say, there's a standard you have to meet to be with me. Well, Especially Janelle, if she ain't married. Janelle oh finds it really God, easy. She'll be teaching a class a on this. Overtime. 
I think more you know, girls need to hear that. <laughs> Janelle will be teaching a class on children and forgiveness. No, it's not children. It's going I'm to take about sixty young seconds. Young women dating. <laughs> no, that's another conversation. I love pushing her buttons. Don't get me started. Push, push. I'll push your buttons. <laughs> push, 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 push. Oh, okay. All right, we gotta go. Yeah, we gotta go. <laughs> Before this gets too heated. <laughs> All right, we out. Love you, fam. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Drop them if necessary. That's right. More women need to hear that. Oh, if they're dating. Not married. I don't know how to turn it off because it says it's not connected. <laughs> you look confused. Okay, Maybe I'll just... Right? Uh, see you guys. <laughs> we can't stop it. So we're just going to keep going. What's cracking? Really? <laughs> <laughs> It's triple overtime, Rob. Then what's cracking? Triple overtime. <laughs> Brian and Janelle. <laughs> Kelly, can you help me? Oh, there we go. I I'm back. Oh, see you. Guys. Bye, guys. Bye. Nope. Nope. Not bye. Uh, what, you guys nope. don't call me anymore? Well, I'm going to turn it off. Because <laughs> it's not working.